George Eldridge has worked at NASA for over 30 years, doing just one job. One job with a lot of titles, like Super Sniffer, Master Sniffer, Chief Smeller, and Nostril Damus. Aldridge smells everything that goes in the space shuttle to make sure it isn't noxious. After all, you can't just open a window once you're in space. Just ask the Russians, they had to abort a mission in 1976 because of some hideous stench. Aldridge is a natural. He has never failed NASA's calibration test in which he must identify seven primary odors. His mission on this day is to smell a cork NASA hopes to use aboard the shuttle. A chemist uses a syringe to pull air from a chamber holding the item. Then she injects the air into George's face mask. The cork wins his approval. But some decisions are tougher than others. Word of his unusual skill has spread. He once appeared on a television quiz show to tell the truth. But fame never interferes with his day job or his sense of duty. He has now sniffed over 780 different materials. And George will go on smelling for space, trying to ferret out the right stuff. Apollo 16, man's fifth lunar landing, sat silently on the pad awaiting its mission. Inside the astronauts' quarters, its relaxed crew ate breakfast. John Young, the veteran of three previous space flights, was commander. Ken Mattingly, command module pilot, would conduct orbital experiments around the moon, while Charles Duke explored the lunar surface with Young. Less than two days earlier, it looked as though this mission would never even get off the ground. It was, in Young's words, a real cliffhanger. The Marshall Space Flight Center team was working on a launch vehicle gyroscope problem which threatened to scrub the mission. Less than an hour before liftoff, their advisory to the Kennedy Center launch team was go. The liftoff had been perfect. During the three-day flight to lunar orbit, the problems encountered had been more annoyances than critical, such as paint flaking off the lunar module, and later, a jammed antenna in one of the lunar module's several communication systems. All in all, a quiet flight. The burn into lunar orbit was right on. The next maneuver was for Mattingly to burn the main engine of his spacecraft to put it into a circular orbit. But as the lunar module emerged from behind the moon, there were some unforeseen problems with the engine. Once it was established they were not serious, the mission was back on track. John Young and Charles Duke landed in the Descartes Plateau. Contact. Stop. Ooh. 
After several hours sleep, Mission Commander John Young stepped on to the Descartes formation and their exploration of the moon commenced. August 25th, 1981, and Voyager 2 arrived at Saturn. The spacecraft had journeyed a billion miles from Earth in four years. Voyager 1, in its November 1980 encounter, first revealed the beauty and complexity of the ringed planet and its family of satellites. Now Voyager 2 will explore specific targets in Saturn's realm. This computer simulated film shows a time condensed view of Voyager 2's tour of the system. This is Voyager 2 on its approach as the spacecraft's cameras and other instruments scan the planet and most of its 17 known moons. The ultraviolet spectrometer instrument looks at regions around the sun, lit and dark edges of the planet studying Saturn's emission of ultraviolet radiation. The instrument's field of view is represented by the rectangle moving up and down the northern limb as it searches for aurora in the upper atmosphere of Saturn. As the spacecraft approaches Saturn, it performs a roll turn to sample the environment around the planet. Voyager 2 is extensively reprogrammed in flight based upon the scientific discoveries of its twin spacecraft. Saturn's rings are targeted for special study during Voyager 2's approach. Sections of the braided F ring are studied from different points of view to create three dimensional pictures of the strands of the ring. Dark spoke-like features in the B-ring are photographed as they move around the planet. Muted atmospheric activity in Saturn's cloud tops is monitored. Voyager 2 flies above the ring plane and crosses the plane just once after its closest approach to Saturn. One important science objective is the photopolarimeter observation of the occultation of a star by the rings. Light from the star Delta Scorpii is measured as it flashes through the rings in the shadow of Saturn. The two and a quarter hour experiment provided information on the number of ringlets, their densities and widths. The infrared interferometer spectrometer measures changes in the temperature of the moon Titus as it moves into Saturn's shadow. The circle around the moon represents the instrument's field of view. The rate at which Titus cools as it moves out of the sunlight provides clues to the composition and the history of the icy moon. Voyager 2 now moves to its closest approach to Saturn. Flying 63,000 miles above the cloud tops, the spacecraft moves into the shadow of the planet. The Earth and Sun disappear from view. Flying down and through the ring plane near the faint G-ring, Voyager's radio voice is cut off by the planet, then is heard again as the spacecraft emerges from the shadows to resume communication with Earth. High-resolution photographs of the planet and satellites 
are assembled from mosaics of images covering separate areas of each target. From a distance of about 58,000 miles, Voyager's cameras compose a four-image mosaic of Titus. In the early hours of August 26, 1981, Voyager 2 left the Saturn system. After Saturn, Voyager 2 flew almost two billion miles on a four and a half year journey to Uranus, which it encountered in January 1986. Three years and one and a half billion miles more take the spacecraft to Neptune in August 1989, completing Voyager's tour of the giant outer planets. Of all the other places that life might exist in the solar system, the chances appeared greatest that life may have at some time existed on Mars. And so a simulated expedition was developed on computer. After traveling through space for nearly one year, a unique landing craft approaches Mars. to soft land on a planet covered with dust. In the Martian dust, there may be chemical evidences of life. In 1975, two Viking spacecraft were launched, each of which was programmed to land a robot on the Martian surface. One of its principal objectives was to test for the presence or absence of living organisms. A communications system linked the spacecraft to the Mission Control and Computing Center in Pasadena, California. On June 19, 1976, the first Viking arrived in the vicinity of Mars after a year-long journey of more than 400 million miles. Once in orbit, its cameras were turned to a detailed examination of the landing area. While the landers conducted experiments on the surface, the orbiters swinging around the planet measured variations in moisture and temperature and took high resolution photographs of the Martian terrain. Over millions of years, the repeated flows of lava had built the volcanic mountains of Mars. Twelve are larger than any on Earth. The largest, Olympus Mons, rises three times higher than Mount Everest and is broad enough to cover the whole chain of volcanoes that form the Hawaiian Islands. The primary purpose of the early shuttle missions was to effectively deliver and return satellites into Earth's orbit. But they also conducted many valuable scientific experiments and were responsible for several other firsts in space. After making its first voyage into space on STS-4, the Continuous Flow Electrophoresis System, CFIS, flew again on shuttle flights 6, 7 and 8. The device is a prototype unit to purify material for the treatment of disease. Combined results from earlier flights demonstrated that CFIS could separate over 700 times more material and purify over four times that which could be achieved in Earth's gravity. Shuttle Flight 8 was the first use of CFIS to separate living cells. Some of the samples were separated to continue research at Pennsylvania State University and Johnson Space Center, Texas. Others were used to further diabetes research. Other scientific activity conducted on earlier shuttle flights focused, as the CFIS had, on research and materials processing and was greatly enhanced when performed in the weightlessness of space. 
The mono-dispersed latex reactor was flown in a continuing attempt to improve the production of polystyrene latex microspheres for cancer research and glaucoma research. Five student experiments flew on the four flights as part of an annual science competition. Studies varied from fluid convection to sponge and crystal growth to biofeedback. 23 getaway special canisters were flown. Some contained stamped envelopes of the US Post Office commemorating spaceflight. Others grew snow, exposed seeds to zero gravity, and studied the effects of weightlessness on a colony of ants. NASA's Getaway Special Program was a unique opportunity to fly small self-contained payloads on board shuttles on a space available basis at a very low cost. Perhaps the studies with the most human interest were those done on space adaptation syndrome, also known as space motion sickness. A malady which affects approximately half of all astronauts. The most extensive studies of SAS focused primarily on the neurological system. Oral sensitivities were tested, as well as eye movements and repeated physical motion. Measurements were taken of limb volume and external tissue pressure. If any of these tests look torturous, it's no wonder the crew dubbed the doctor's mid-deck working area a chamber of horrors and mockingly gave him a taste of his own medicine. With ejection seats gone from the flight deck and water storage tanks and instrumentation gone from the mid-deck, there was much more room to accommodate larger crews. There was also opportunity for privacy, exercise, and as usual on any important trip, plenty of food. The success of these shuttle flights represented many accomplishments for the Space Shuttle program. Most importantly, the missions proved the operational capability of the space transportation system, that useful work can be done in space for the benefit of people on Earth. Although we are investigating the planets of our solar system, we have also been trying to understand more about our sun. Man has been fascinated by the sun since the beginning of time. In ancient Britain, the Druids built a mysterious monument to it while in Egypt. The sun was worshipped as a deity and its passage from day to night was sanctified. The Mayans offered sacrifices to the sun. The Aztecs found it represented time. Although there have been many representations of it from paintings to monuments, we still have a long way to go to fully understand its workings. In the early years of man's study of the universe, there were different beliefs as to its role. Some thought it was not the center of the solar system, but that the Earth was. It was Claudius Potomius who devised the first complete system of the universe. He lived in Alexandria around 200 AD and said that the Earth was the center of the universe. The sun and the planets turn around it in circles. Beyond the planets lies the celestial sphere of stars which also turns around the Earth. We have learned much since those times. Today we know that the family of planets, asteroids and comets circle the sun. We also know that our star is like a tiny grain of dust in the universe. In fact, there are so many stars, we cannot count them all. Our sun is an average size star. It has been found that some small stars do not travel in the company of other stars. And our sun is one of these. Astronomers are able to study the Sun in great detail to try and get a better understanding of its structure and energy. It is almost like a vast laboratory. The Sun can be studied using a spectroscope. The dark lines that cut across the spectrum band are produced by the radiation from the Sun's interior shining through its atmosphere. Each line is the signature of a chemical element such as sodium, iron and calcium. It is this array of lines that forms the code which describes the properties and motion of a star. By narrowing the view of the sun to a single line of the spectrum, each level of the solar atmosphere can be photographed. 
By using computer mapping and color processing, it is possible to distinguish the levels of brightness. In this way, a detailed and multi-dimensional picture is obtained of the sun undergoing dramatic and turbulent change. The sun is a sphere of hot seething gases and surges of radiation. Most of the lines we get from the sun comes from a thin bright layer which defines its visible edge, the photosphere. Above it, the chromosphere, a region of flaming outbursts of gas, extends through a transition zone to the thin outer atmosphere of the corona. Deep beneath the sun's atmospheric shell is the core, a violent nuclear furnace. Here, hydrogen is fused into helium and in the process, some of the matter is converted into an enormous amount of energy. Radiating outward as a gas, it behaves like a boiling liquid beneath the surface. The turbulent bubbling motion is visible in the granular cells of the phonosphere. Sunspots, regions of intense magnetic fields, appear on the surface. They disappear in a few hours or grow and persist for months in a mysterious 11-year cycle. The Sun rotates once every 27 days. Because its equatorial regions rotate faster than the polar caps, the shearing action in the gas contorts the magnetic field into tangled structures which give rise to the Sun's eruptive action. The dark areas across the solar disk are coronal holes which may provide new clues to the Sun's interior and may be a source of the solar wind which blows outwards to the farthest planets. On Earth, the effects of these solar events are visible when auroras light up the dark Arctic sky and radio communication is disrupted. The Sun is an average middle-aged star, yet it will generate heat and light for billions of years to come, as it has for five billion years past. It dominates the motion of all bodies in the solar system.